So this is talking about um, probability distributions. So we're going to talk about ways we can um, define probability distributions that describe our um, describe our random variables and, and how we use them in a risk analysis. So we're going to talk about discrete random variables, continuous random variables, some of the ones we commonly use in risk analysis, and we'll revisit uncertainty a little bit. So what's probability distribution? Formal definition, a semi-formal definition would be it's a mathematical description of a random variable. And we saw this on the last presentation in terms of its uh, sample space and the probabilities of the events or values that exist within that sample space. Um, one of the common types is referred to as a parametric distribution. So parametric distribution just, just means that we're describing the distribution with some mathematical equation, formula, function, whatever you'd like to call it, that gives us the shape and range of that distribution based on uh, just a few uh, parameters, right? So we can come up with just a few parameters and an and a, and a equation, and then we can fully describe the distribution from that. So um, the generic way to talk about parameters for distributions are you will usually see them described as location, scale, and shape, and then also a shift factor. So um, location you can think of loosely as being roughly a representative of the typical value. Um, scale you can very loosely think of it being representative of um, the variability. Shape, very loosely, you can think of it in terms of um, symmetry or asymmetry. And then the shift factor is just a way to adjust um, things in, in space. Um, so a simple example here, a normal distribution, um, the location parameter for a normal distribution is the mean. Um, so oftentimes you will see location, scale, and shape can be defined in terms of um, the moments of either the distribution or the data. And then the scale parameter um, for a normal distribution is just a standard deviation, and it doesn't have a, a shape factor. Um, if you wanted to add a shift to it, you would basically just add a term um, to the x value, right, add or subtract, right, that would shift essentially the distribution left or right. That's kind of what a shift factor would do, uh, generally speaking, in terms of defining a distribution. So the, the bottom bottom right there, you can see that's the, that's the equation for the um, distribution, um, for a normal distribution that has a mean of mu and a standard deviation of sigma. Uh, we talked about this a little bit, I think, yesterday. So one of the common things we do with distributions is we often um, like to standardize, standardize them um, because it can put different um, different dis uh, distributions for different variables on the same scale, which again makes it much easier to do um, basic visual and numerical comparisons between them. Um, how you standardize really depends on the specific distribution. Um, and there's just one example shown here for a normal distribution. We talked about this yesterday where you transform things to um, normal probability space or Z space, where Z is equal to the X value divided by the, or sorry, uh, minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. So um, a standard normal has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So um, again, this is just a way to kind of normalize things and it's often done either because it simplifies some of the calculations we do with these distributions, or it can um, make it easier to do comparisons. So two, two general types of uh, random variables and distributions and how we define them and describe them. So discrete random variables, so we're going to talk about two types of variables, discrete and continuous, and two ways to um, um, essentially define um, a distribution. So discrete, first is discrete, and we're talking about the probability mass function. So the probability mass function for a discrete random variable gives us a probability for each uh, of the possible values of the random variable. So in this example here, we have number of spillway gates that don't open when we push the open button. Um, and each, uh, each possible outcome, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6 gates that don't open 
has a probability associated with it that we can read directly off of this type of plot or directly from the probability mass function. So in this example, what's the probability that two gates don't open? It's just the height of this, this bar on this bar chart. Usually these are portrayed as bar chart or um, bar plots or column plots. Um, so this example, it would be 0.1. So the probability is the probability that the random variable equals a specific value. Um, the other way uh, we can um, define and show these distributions for discrete random variables is with the cumulative distribution function. So this is um, analogous to some of the things we talked about yesterday in terms of um, when we were doing um, uh, empirical cumulative distribution functions, right, and percentiles and, and some of the things you looked at in the, uh, in the exercise. So again, cumulative distribution function um, defines basically probability of less than or equal to. So um, this is the same distribution plotted um, cumulatively where um, the probability here on the vertical axis is the probability that the number of spillway gates that don't open is less than or equal to a particular value. So again, we can read it directly off this plot. P of n less than or equal to 1 comes directly from this bar at 1, which in this example is, um, is 0.88. And um, so again, depending on what, what you're interested, what type of question you're you're asking of your uh, data or in your model, right, might might suggest which which way you want to um, define and present the distribution for a random variable. Second type is continuous, and again, it'll be the same two things, but the the, uh, the, the phrasing is a little bit different for a deliberate reason on this first one that I'll, I'll mention. So for continuous random variables, we can portray them as a probability density function. So it's it's different from the probability mass function we saw um, for a discrete random variable. So um, the discrete random variable, the, the probability mass function gives us an actual probability. And for a continuous random variable, the, the PDF or the density function only gives us a probability density as the name implies. Um, so if we want an actual probability, we have to um, essentially go from that density to a probability mass. And the way we do that is we have to look at a range of values. So by definition, um, when you have a continuous random variable, the probability of the random variable being a specific value is not defined. There is no probability. So you cannot, uh, if, you, if you ask yourself, well, what's the probability that the PGA will be equal to 0 0.1? Um, that question does not have an answer. Um, it does not exist in the world of probability. So uh, one of the ways you can um, get to that probability is you can look at a range of values. So in this example, we were asking, okay, well, what's the probability that the PGA is between 0.1 and 0.2 g? Um, to get that from the probability density function, it's it's an integral, and you know, remember from math, integrals are essentially areas under the function, right? So we calculate the area under this function between 0.1 and 0.2. That gets us a probability mass from the density. Um, and so that area is 0.23, which is equal to the probability. The formal way of calculating it is with this integral. We integrate the density function between the two values that we're interested in estimating the probability, but that's just the area under the under this function. So it's really important to remember that, that, that the probability for a specific value is undefined, because it um, not recognizing that leads to some common mistakes um, that happen in, in risk analysis. Uh, the other way to look at continuous random variables is with the cumulative distribution function. Um, so again, this is analogous to the discrete version. Um, it's also called a cumulative distribution function. Um, and it, it in, in the same way, it gives us the probability that the random variable is less than or equal to a particular value. So uh, there's two ways. Um, or there's more than two, but there's several ways to calculate these things. One is you can just, if you're interested in it being less than a particular value, um, the formal way of writing that out is you can write it out as an integral of the density function from minus infinity up to the value uh, that you're interested in estimating that cumulative probability for. Um, we sometimes call this a non-exceedance probability as well. You'll see that commonly used. 
So that's kind of the formal mathematical way. And if, if, you're, um, if your distribution has uh, support that's different from minus infinity, let's say you have a log normal distrib or a log distribution um, where the, the lower bound for the support is zero, right, that then this, this bottom part of the integral would be zero. But the, the generic, generic way of showing it is minus infinity to be uh, integral of the density function gives you um, the non-exceedance or cumulative probability. Um, and then you can also get probabilities for, again, you can't get the probability for a specific value, right? But you can get probabilities for a range of values. So the same range that we had on the previous slide, PGA between 0.1 and 0.2, we can calculate that by saying, okay, what's the probability that it's less than 0.2? That's 0.89 from this plot. What's the probability that it's less than 0.1? That's 0.66 from this plot. And if we take the difference between those two values, that gives us the probability that it's in between. Um, so that you'll see this. This is commonly in risk models when we discretize either a flood hazard or a seismic hazard curve. Um, this is generally the technique we use to, to discretize it into these slices or bins of loading. Um, and we do a calculation like this to get a probability for each of those um, slices. Now, what you'll typically see on hazard curves is you'll typically see them portrayed as survival functions. Um, in the Corps of Engineers, we usually don't call them survival functions, but that's what that's the formal term for them. Um, we will often call them exceedance curves, or we'll just call them, you know, flood hazard or seismic hazard curves or whatever it might be. Um, so, an exceedance curve is or a survival function is just a complement of the cumulative distribution function. So, you can calculate by taking one minus um, one minus the cumulative distribution function, or you can calculate it by just doing the integral in the other direction, right? You can integrate um, for all values of x greater than the value you're interested in. So you'd go from x to plus infinity and integrate the density function. Um, and again, this is usually how hazard curves are portrayed, um, at least in, in the Corps of Engineers. Um, so, again, you can read, if you want to ask the question, what's the probability of a PGA greater than 0.2? You can look that up directly on this plot, and in this example, it's 0.11. Um, and again, the key here is that it's not the probability of 0.2, it's the probability greater than 0.2. So, again, this is where the common mistake can come in, is you have to always remember to um, discretize your hazard curves into these slices or bins. Um, because if you just use the exceedance probability, um, you're going to end up essentially double counting um, the hazard and getting the risk estimate incorrectly. So in practice and risk analysis, we're always doing something along the lines of, of, of these kind of um, intervals. Okay. Uh, this example uh, is called a quantile function. So the, the hydrology folks and the seismic folks do things a little bit differently. So technically, you know, the technical term um, for the way um, flood hydrology folks usually portray their hazard curves is, is a quantile function. So it's really just the axes are reversed, right? So in a typical seismic hazard curve, you'll see probability on the vertical axis and, and you know, whatever parameter of interest, PGA, on the horizontal. For some reason, the hydrologists like to show um, probability on the horizontal and the variable, in this case, annual maximum reservoir stage on the vertical axis. So it's the same information, but if you portray it this way, technically, it's called a quantile function uh, because you're making the um, you're making the, the variable a function of the probability. So not a big deal, but just realize that you'll see these portrayed different ways, and they're called different things. Um, descriptive statistics, we've talked about this a lot already. So uh, you can describe these distributions with the same statistics we used yesterday and earlier today, so mean, median, mode and lots of others. Remember, mean is the centroid, so if you were to take the center, center of mass of this shape, right, that's going to be the mean. Variance is dispersion, so again, analogous to um, the moment of inertia. Again, it's the second moment. Um, 
same measures we've talked about already, and then skew is um, symmetry. And again, this one looks like it has a fairly high um, positive skew with the long tail to the right here on this example. So we can use these same statistics to summarize our distributions. And oftentimes, those statistics um, can be related to the location, scale, and shape parameters of our parametric distributions, right? So you'll see, um, for example, the normal is the classic case, right, where you'll see, you know, the location is the mean and the, and the scale is the standard deviation. So you'll see that across a whole host of distributions. Um, there's also this concept of distribution families. We're not going to cover a bunch of distribution families, but just know that there's often collections of parametric distributions that are all related to each other in some way. So one such family is called the gamma distribution, just used for example here. And what happens is you can have um, distributions um, that evolve from a family of distributions based on um, different um, values that either lo the location scale or shape might have. So for example, if you take a gamma distribution and um, give it a scale parameter beta of uh, 1, you end up with an exponential distribution. Similarly with chi-squared, right, if you give it um, a shape parameter that's based on df, which is the degrees of freedom, and a, and a shape parameter of um, 2, you'll get chi-squared. Similarly, you can do that with Pearson type 3. You can derive a Pearson type 3, which is um, log Pearson type 3 is the one we use a lot in flood hydrology. You can derive that from the gamma distribution as well. So it's just kind of good to know that there's um, these not just distributions. They don't all live in isolation. There's these collections of distributions that all have similar properties and can subsume um, other distributions depending on what their parameter values are. So I'm going to breeze through a couple of the well, maybe more than a couple of the common distributions that you'll see in risk analysis. There's hundreds of distributions, so we can't cover them all, but these are some of the common ones. So uniform is a symmetrical distribution. It has a, a lower and an upper bound, and all values have the same likelihood or probability, so it has, as the name implies, a uniform density function. Um, so properties like that might be relevant, right, when you're choosing a distribution. Is there an upper bound? Is there a lower bound? You know, is there a, a, a more likely value? Does it have a, a big tail or a small tail? All these types of things can, can help you choose, choose a distribution. So we use this a lot in Monte Carlo analysis for random uh, number generation. And we use it um, sometimes in risk analysis when you, you know, you have a range, but you have no idea what the value might be within that range. So you just say it's equally likely. Triangular is, is when you might say there might be a value somewhere in the middle that's more likely than other values. So it's a simple three-parameter distribution, a minimum, maximum, and a most likely value. Uh, again, it's bounded by the min and max. And uh, in between uh, the min and the most likely and the most likely and the max, it's just linear, hence the name triangle. Um, one thing to always remember with some of these distributions, triangular is one, pert's another one. The most likely value is the mode. It is not the mean. So if you're doing, if you're trying to do a, a, a estimate, a mean estimate of the risk, don't use the most likely value from a triangular distribution. Actually calculate what the mean value is and use that value because the most likely is the mode. It's not the mean. If the, if the distribution is not symmetrical, as is the case here, if the, if the most likely value is not right in the middle, right in this example here, the mean is going to be somewhere over here to the right of the most likely value. OK, so normal distribution, classic bell-shaped curve. Uh, it's unbounded, so that's good to know, right? It goes from minus infinity to infinity. And it has a, a mean as the most likely value and a standard deviation. It's also symmetrical. Um, so there's, there's a skew of uh, 0. Um, log normal. Log normal is bounded on the, on the lower end by 0. Upper end can go to infinity. Also has a mean and a standard deviation. Um, you do got to be careful with this, uh, with using log normal distributions, because different software packages handle it differently. Um, so uh, you can define the parameters of a log normal distribution in, in real space, so in terms of their real values, or you can do it in log space. 
and you will see different formulations in different textbooks. So, you know, like, I, and I don't remember off the top of my head which one Excel uses, but you always got to make sure, at least because it, it, it'll trip you up, make sure you know which formulation they're using in, you know, if you're using Excel or some other piece of software so that you know whether, you know, when it tells you to enter the mean and standard deviation, whether that's the real space mean or the mean of the logarithms because um, you will get a drastically different result. So just be aware of that and be on the lookout for that when using log normal because um, it doesn't seem to be consistent across different software packages. Uh, PERT uh, is commonly used in expert elicitation because it's, it's a nice smooth um, distribution that only requires three parameters. Uh, it is bounded, so it has a lower bound and an upper bound or a min and a max, and it has a most likely value. And again, the most likely is not the mean, it's the mode. So, um, And again, these all have complicated equations. There's lots of software packages out there that have these built in for you. Um, Excel does not have a lot of these distributions, to be honest. It's not really built for statistics, um, but it does have some of them. So this is used a lot um, when you when you know the range and you know some estimate of a value in between that might be more likely than other values. Widely used in uh, expert elicitation. Exponential, so exponential is um, models the time between events in a Poisson process. So we talked about um, uh, the Poisson process earlier when we did the knowledge check, right? And I did that little ad hoc example for you. So this is where that comes from, right? So if you have say floods that occur at a certain rate of, you know, in our example is 0.01 per year, um, you can then use the exponential distribution. So in this case, you know, you can take, this. actually this is pretty much the formula I used, right? One minus e to the minus lambda t gave us the probability of experiencing a flood over that 30 year period. Uh, Weibull distribution, Weibull distribution is often used in reliability analysis and often used in time dependent analysis. Um, so if, if the thing you're measuring is time to failure, then the Weibull distribution will give you a distribution for which um, the rate of failure is proportional to the time. So that's often used in, in um, reliability analysis. And there's a classic um, result you can get from the Weibull distribution, which is called the bathtub curve, where you have a high failure rate during the early years um, which is generally called the warranty period, right? So if something breaks early, it's going to break due to a defect, right? And then you have a relatively steady period of time where the failure rate's relatively constant, usually just due to random things that break. And then as things age, right, the, the curve will come back up and the failure rate will go up because of things wearing out and they start to break more when they wear out, right? So they call that kind of the bathtub curve which is a classic um, thing you'll see in time-dependent reliability analysis. And there's lots, lots more. I think the key is, is when you're deciding on distributions is thinking about a few things, right? What, what does my data look like? What should it look like, right? Do I know something about the process? Um, is there you know, some standard practice in your discipline where you use, you know, use you know, log Pearson type three for floods or whatever it might be? Um, but regardless, when you choose a distribution, always always at least consider and document the rationale, right? So why why did you pick it, right? And uh, we'll cover later uh, when we get into in the next lecture on distribution fitting how to um, one of the ways we can measure how good data fits to a distribution. Um, other distributions we can look at. We get into distributions that have multiple variables. So one of the Simple common ones is called the multivariate normal. So that's basically when you have two or more normally distributed variables such that any um, linear combination of the variables would also be normally distributed. So this is uh, just, just a two variable case, right, where you have two, um, two um, variables that are normally distributed. Um, so the combination of those two variables is also going to be a uh, normal distribution. So uh, this comes into play in a, in a variety of places in in, uh, in some of the more advanced topics on risk analysis, but there there are distributions that you can have that are in the dimension of, of multiple uh, multiple random variables. 
All right, a little bit more on uncertainty. So we're talking about two types of uncertainty. So confidence intervals. Um, confidence intervals come from the frequentist definition and paradigm of statistics. It gives us a range of values that describe the uncertainty surrounding an estimate. They're usually computed at some specified confidence level, and they're defined by two endpoints that we call confidence limits. So if we say we want, say, a 90% um, confidence level or confidence interval, um, then we, we would have an alpha of 0.1, right, and 1 minus 0.1 would be our 90% um, confidence interval or level. And then the two endpoints of that would be at the 5% and the 95% confidence limits, right? Those define the two endpoints of the interval. So that's just kind of the standard notation for, for doing that. Um, what a confidence interval means is often misinterpreted. Um, we actually luck out in some ways because the misinterpretation is usually not catastrophic, but um, technically it is a misinterpretation. So here uh, the formal definition for a confidence interval is that if we do repeated sampling, a 90% confidence interval will contain the true value of whatever parameter is we're measuring in 90% of those samples. Um, so, you know, what the heck does that mean? Um, so I'll give you an example. Let's say you go and you, you feel sick and you go take a COVID test and you test positive. If I live in the frequentist world of probability, I cannot tell you what the probability is that you have COVID based on you getting a positive test result. All I can tell you is that um, that based on repeated tests of people, you know, uh, repeated sampling of people who have taken a test, I can tell you that for every 100 people who tested positive, 90% of those people actually had COVID. Um, so I can't make a statement about your probability, although that's where the misinterpretation comes in, right? We often treat confidence intervals and make statements about uh, probabilities that are, again, luckily, rarely catastrophic, but strictly speaking, incorrect. So from a frequentist point of view or in the frequentist world of probability, you took that positive test, there is, or you tested positive, there's no probability that you have it, right? You either have it or you don't. There is no probability. Um, so that's a little bit wonky, but um, that is the formal definition of confidence intervals. So in the frequentist world, the parameters are fixed values. But we don't know. We just don't know what they are, and the confidence interval is is the random variable based on repeated sampling. So that one has always given me trouble intuitively, and I've made the mistake of misinterpreting confidence intervals frequently. Um, so that's why we cover it here. Uh, credible intervals is kind of the Bayesian counterpart of confidence intervals, and we call them credible intervals just to differentiate them from confidence intervals. So when we're when we live in the Bayesian world. Um, or in the subjective probability world, uh, a credible interval gives us a range of values that describe the probability that a parameter falls within that range. Um, same concept, we have, a, we have a designated credible level and we have the same concept in terms of how we define the endpoints of that interval. Uh, the big difference here is if you're a, if you're a Bayesian believer, um, I can actually talk about the probability uh, for you for that example with the COVID test, right? So you take a COVID test, you test positive. I can tell you what the probability is that you actually have COVID based on um, the credible interval for that, that particular type of test. So from a Bayesian point of view, the credible interval tells us the probability that you actually have it based on your test result, um, which I think is probably the more intuitive and probably the more common interpretation people naturally make from, from these types of intervals. Um, fortunately, you know, in many applications, there's not a big difference between Bayesian credible intervals and frequentist confidence intervals, so we kind of um, kind of leaves us off the hook a little bit most of the time. Um, so again, you know, credible intervals, at least in my opinion, are a little bit more intuitive, and the premise behind them is that the parameters, again, um, they're not fixed now, right? So in the Bayesian world, the parameters are uncertain. Uh, and also unknown, and the credible interval is fixed based on our data that we have, um, which again, in my opinion, is a little bit more intuitive.